a street walk in Hanoi, part of an international exchange between researchers at Queen's University Belfast and artists and researchers in Hanoi. A project that aimed to discuss different methodological frameworks for thinking of how the diverse range of ethnic minority music that exists in Vietnam, 54 ethnic minorities indeed, how they might best be digitized. Together with my colleagues Marushka Swazek and Ali Fitzgibbon from Queens, we had designed several days of workshops. Our opening activity consisted of an improvisatory, multi-sensory walk in the vicinity of the gallery space in Hanoi, where we were working with invited artists and researchers. The walk we had designed for our participants and ourselves aimed to be explorative, improvisatory, multi-sensory and most of all fun. Improvisation for me as a musician, a sax player, an academic has been informing most of my thinking and doing. Hence it was that flavor that I brought to the work in Hanoi. The concept of improvisation, both as an artistic pursuit and a cognitive endeavor, embodies a multifaceted phenomenon that intersects with notions of identity and attachment within the complex fabric of human experience. Central to this understanding is the deliberate engagement with the not predetermined, whereby improvisation can serve as a microcosm reflecting our perceptual engagement with the world, as articulated by researcher and improviser David Borgo. And at its best, improvised music making is about embracing, and I quote, open, dynamic, adaptive, and ever surprising aspects of complexity. David Borgo again. Improvisational practices in my mind foster choice, collectivity, community building, discovery of self and other, interconnection, listening, questioning, again, questioning of self, questioning of other, amongst many other qualities. But most importantly, improvisation allows us as musicians, and I paraphrase Evan Parker, another improviser, the freedom to behave in accordance with our response to the specific situation. So the aforementioned qualities of improvisation came to the fore during the roughly two hour walk through unfamiliar terrain, devoid of predefined expectations or outcomes, guided by chance elements such as the throw of a dice determining directional choices. This experiential journey facilitated an immersion in the sensory tapestry of the surrounding streets. I allowed myself to be led by the smells, the sounds, the tactility of the footpath, and multiple things I perceived with my eyes. Walking, hearing, listening, sensing and seeing unfolded in tandem with the evolving urban tableau, epitomizing a situated embodied mode of engagement, an immediacy of responsive body, consciousness, intuition, this experiential immediacy, characterized by an intuitive responsiveness, often outpacing conscious thought, resonates with what the deep listening practitioner Pauline Oliverish called body consciousness. Moreover, this embodied experience of improvisation engenders a dialectical interplay between internal reflection and external engagement, where in the flow of questioning inherent to improvisational practice might find resolution through the immediacy of bodily intuition. In responding to the contingency of the moment, a plastic bag adrift in the urban landscape, brooms and brushes tethered to posts, trees festooned with colorful adornments, and taking images on my phone led to an iterative process of creative inquiry. Such encounters not only prompt a re-evaluation of the nature of immediate phenomena, but also inform one's perceptual orientation within the urban milieu. Why are there plastic bags hanging in trees? Why are brooms and brushes always neatly and tightly attached or tied to posts or trees? Why are trees attached to other trees? Cauldrons and small dogs chained to metallic structures or motorbikes. Thus, what commenced as a fluid and open idea of navigating the urban environment gradually coalesced into an explorative engagement guided by the allure of such unfamiliar sights, 
bestowing the act of walking with a heightened sense of purpose and inquiry. As I explored the unfamiliar streets, I found myself immersed in the multifaceted sensory tapestry attuned to the rich array of smells, sounds and sights that enveloped me. This mode of engagement differed markedly from the instrumental navigation facilitated maybe by a mobile device which often prioritizes a predetermined destination, maybe a recommended coffee shop. But rather my experience possibly paralleled Heidegger's notion of Dasein, a concept central to his philosophy, wherein the emphasis lies on the ontological significance of being in the world as the locus of essential inquiry. Within this framework, the act of being there, enveloped within the temporal flux of action, underscores a performative engagement that encapsulates the indivisible unity of presence and temporality of being there and time. And Nettle and Russell in their 1998 paper in the course of performance, studies in the world of musical improvisation, talked of these two essential aspects of the lived experience of improvisation. The essence of improvisation, often conceived of in terms of process rather than fixed product, was palpably manifest throughout my walking. I found myself intricately interwoven within the urban milieu, simultaneously shaping and being shaped by the surrounding or sounding environment, a dynamic interplay, a reciprocal relationship, which has been discussed in more detail by Lewis in Rose 2013, Improvisation, Music and Learning. This reciprocal interaction extended beyond mere observation encompassing the creation of content through the sounds I recorded and the photographs I captured. An improvisatory process inherently molded by contextual nuances as elucidated by Parkinson in his 2016 text The Value of Dance as Practice. I want to reflect briefly on listening. As I strolled along the streets, attuned to the cacophony of urban soundscapes, traffic, human voices, and the ambient chatter permeating the pavement, I honed in on what I was listening to, who was listening to me. This introspective questioning prompted a heightened awareness of my situational context and perhaps afforded a glimpse into what my colleague Simon Waters previously characterized as the unprivileging of our own contribution. This concept, rooted in the act of intent listening, underscores the transcendence of an egocentric perspective, thereby relegating oneself from the vantage point of central prominence. Through this mode of receptive engagement, one can maybe relinquish the preeminence of selfhood. Through listening, we can unprivilege our own selves. It is also imperative to acknowledge that the act of listening organizes us as humans in space and time. An argument I had made previously during a lockdown talk as part of the physically distant network pandemic telematic performance event in 2020, where I felt resonance in the thinkings of the American philosopher Alva Noy, who posits perceptions as organized activities. He says that our lives are intrinsically structured by organization. And so I argued that listening organizes us rhythmically, melodically, textually. And moreover, listening facilitates an introspective understanding of the self and its relational dynamics with others, particularly salient amidst the bustling noises of street traffic I encountered in Hanoi. And so was my attempt to unprivilege myself successful had I effectively ceased to occupy the central locus of my own activity during the walk? It is undeniable that my actions did not escape the notice of onlookers. Indeed, the act of crouching down on the pavement, camera in hand to capture images of seemingly inconsequential objects, such as a plastic bag, inevitably attracted attention. 
In such moments, one becomes a focal point for the gaze of passers-by, a phenomenon laden with implications for the performance of subjectivity. Drawing upon the insights of Judith Butler, who contends that subjectivity is enacted through the material instantiation of knowledge and practice, it becomes apparent that my actions were tantamount to a public display. However, despite this acknowledgement, I desired to detach myself from the foreground and instead foreground the contextual backdrop of the urban milieu. By doing so, I sought to infuse each of my actions with a heightened awareness of the material and social circumstances at play, thereby facilitating a more nuanced understanding of my situated actions a nod perhaps to the conceptual framework advanced by Lucy Suchman in 1987. As a white female foreigner navigating the streets of Hanoi, my situatedness within this locale placed me amidst a complex interplay of interpersonal and environmental dynamics. Inhabiting the space even for a short while, alongside fellow humans and the myriad objects that populated the urban landscape, engendered a profound sense of interconnectedness, a recognition of the multifaceted attachments that shape our relational engagements with people, objects and places throughout the course of our existence. Let me briefly ponder about this notion of attachments. As the engagements with objects and the ways in which they embody individual and collective identities reflecting cultural norms, aesthetic preferences and life experiences, focused my attention to the ways things were attached. Bags attached to people, dogs to chains, trees to trees, rocks to strings, wheelbarrows to trees, humans to things, or things to humans. I acknowledge, of course, that I impose a rather personal narrative, infusing artifacts with my emotional resonance and symbolic significance. Maybe a shackled dog is a canine kept safe. A chain bike is a bike not to be taken, where attachments fill people with a sense of comfort and belonging. Material possessions, a box on a motorbike, for example, assume symbolic significance in the construction of identity, serving as extensions of the self and repositories of personal meaning. Returning to my point of departure, I reconvene with fellow participants, disengaging from the in-ear microphones that facilitated my immersion in a distinct auditory realm. This transition heralded a reintegration into a very different sonic environment, disrupting the inwardly directed focus that had characterized my preceding walking experience. On re-entering the communal space, the gallery where we gathered, full of dialogue and verbal exchanges of experiences, I reflect upon the preceding two hours of embodied ambulatory engagement as a rather idiosyncratic act of improvisatory meaning-making, a process which, while potentially perceived as self-indulgent, remains somewhat uncertain in its capacity to confer meaning upon the entities encountered, whether human, canine or other. After all, I entertain the possibility that my embodied presence constituted merely one among many within the social milieu of the streets where our bodies are and become, as Donna Haraway makes us reflect, objects of knowledge in the world, thought of as, quote, material semiotic generative nodes whose boundaries materialize in social interaction, unquote. Mm -hmm.